I'm often asked if someone suffering from electrohypersensitivity can recover. And the answer to that question is yes, with the right protocol. What do we know about electromagnetic exposure? We know that electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic radiation are forms of air pollution. Electrosmog is generated by wireless technology, electronic devices, and our use of electricity. Electrosmog falls into four categories, all of which contribute to chronic illness. They include extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields, radio frequency radiation, dirty electricity, and ground current. We also know that our exposure to electrosmog is increasing exponentially, as shown here for Wi-Fi in 2005 and 2020. What do we know about the effects of exposure to electrosmog? We know that electromagnetic exposure can lead to EMI cubed, which stands for electromagnetic interference, electromagnetic illness, and electromagnetic injury. The technical definition of electromagnetic interference, EMI, is unwanted noise or interference in an electrical path or circuit caused by an outside source. EMI can be caused by natural or human-made sources, and electromagnetic interference can cause electronics to operate poorly, malfunction, or stop working completely. Similarly, electromagnetic interference can cause humans to operate poorly, malfunction, or stop working completely, since we are electromagnetic beings as demonstrated by brainwave activity and the activity of the heart. If electromagnetic interference is prolonged, it can lead to illness, and if exposure is prolonged or severe, it can lead to injury. The primary effects of electromagnetic exposure include reproductive problems, increased risk of various types of cancers, and neurological or cognitive effects that also include electrohypersensitivity. Scientific evidence is based on epidemiological studies that show an association between exposure and effects, in vivo studies that show a cause-effect relationship, and in vitro studies that determine mechanisms. And we have known about the biological effects of microwave radiation since the 1970s. That's more than 50 years ago. In 2004, the World Health Organization held a meeting on EMF hypersensitivity in Prague. They defined electrohypersensitivity as a phenomenon where individuals experience adverse health effects while using or being near devices emitting electromagnetic fields. They go on to state that EHS is real and can be disabling and occurs at levels orders of magnitude below internationally accepted standards. At this meeting, the World Health Organization recommended that the term EHS be replaced with idiopathic environmental intolerance attributed to electromagnetic fields. Idiopathic refers to any disease or condition which arises spontaneously or for which the cause is unknown. So if electromagnetic fields trigger the reaction, what causes people to be sensitive to this energy in the first place? We found there are five common precursors for electrohypersensitivity. Physical trauma to the central nervous system, such as whiplash or a concussion. Chemical exposure to neurotoxins, including pesticides, metals, and medication. Electromagnetic exposure, either chronic or acute. Biological trauma in the form of mold, Lyme disease, or high parasite load. And an impaired immune system that may, may come with age or illness. These are common symptoms of EHS. Difficulty sleeping, chronic fatigue, chronic pain, mood disorders, cognitive disorders, visual disruptions, hearing problems like tinnitus, heart palpitations, skin problems, and dizziness. Doctors will often prescribe sleeping pills, pain medication, and antidepressants, and while these may relieve the symptoms, they are not treating the root cause of this illness. 
full recovery is more likely if the root cause is treated. Reducing exposure to electrosmog that triggers symptoms of EHS is necessary, but may not be sufficient to enable a person to fully recover. Recovery is more likely if the root cause is treated. And we may consider treating the precursors as causal agents in EHS. Consequently, someone suffering from physical trauma to their central nervous system would require different treatment than someone who has Lyme disease or has an excessively high load of mercury. We refer to the root cause protocol for treating EHS as R squared ID cubed. R1 stands for reducing exposure to all forms of environmental toxins, including electromagnetic, chemical, and biological. R2 stands for resetting the limbic system and the automatic nervous system to enable healing to take place. I stands for supporting the immune system that may be underactive, overactive, or otherwise compromised. D1 stands for detoxification of the body from both chemical toxins and biological infections. This needs to be done carefully and it can be helped enormously with D2 which stands for DNA testing that enables a more personalized detoxification protocol. D3 stands for dental work that includes dealing with fillings, implants, and infections that may compromise recovery. Electrohypersensitivity is primarily a first world problem. According to Bevington, 0.065% of the population can't work. 1.5% have severe symptoms, 5% have moderate symptoms, and 30% have mild symptoms. If we use these values, we can estimate the number of people affected in different regions as shown here. Estimates in developing countries may be lower, hence the less than sign. Those who can't work or are severely affected are considered disabled. What does the future hold for electromagnetic interference or electrohypersensitivity? Currently, about a third of the population has mild symptoms. If we do nothing and levels of electrosmog continue to increase, then we are going to face an increasingly serious health problem. Many people will be adversely affected and some will be disabled by their exposure. However, if we begin to reduce exposure and establish electrosmog-free environments, then fewer people will suffer the consequences. My mantra is, if it doesn't move, it doesn't need to be wireless. A society that doesn't take care of its children doesn't have a future, and we are doing a poor job taking care of children. If we do nothing, then anxiety-prone children will be taking care of their neurologically damaged parents. We need to stop this insanity. If not us, who? If not now, when? Here are some excellent websites that provide valuable information to both patients and their doctors. Please share this video. It may save someone's life.